Hello, I'm glad to present this special interview with uh, the Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Mr. Mohammad Yavad Zarif. Welcome to Telesur. Good to be with you. You have just met President Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. What was the atmosphere of this conversation? What topics did you talk about? And how do you assess the bilateral ties between Iran and Venezuela so far? Uh, we have excellent relations between Iran and Venezuela. Uh, and the meeting with uh, President Maduro was uh, very friendly. Uh, he was very gracious uh, to receive me at his home. Uh, we had a uh, good conversation about how to further enhance bilateral relations uh, in the area of energy, uh, science and technology, uh, COVID-19, where Venezuela has made significant progress and Iran has made significant progress and we can share. By the way, well, how's the situation of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Iran nowadays? Well, it's, it's not that uh, good. Uh, because of the huge uh, impact of the virus on the Iranian society very early on uh, and the fact that uh, less than uh, perfect uh, adherence uh, to social distancing, to uh, health protocols uh, is being observed in Iran. So uh, we have uh, too high a number of casualties. Uh, but uh, we have made uh, significant advances uh, in producing a vaccine, uh, significant advances in trying to find a remedy. Uh, we understand that Venezuela is also making progress in these areas. So we're going How have you observed uh, the way the Venezuelan government is dealing with the pandemic? Well, I see, I see the public uh, respect for uh, the protocols, the health protocols to be uh, excellent here. The so-called 7 plus 7 uh, method. 7 plus 7 method is an interesting method. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able uh, to impose a quarantine in, in Iran because of uh, the necessity for our uh, population to continue to work. Uh, the population is not ready. Uh, to have a lockdown, uh, so uh, we have a different situation, but, but we thought that the 7 plus 7 uh, idea was a, uh, an interesting innovation here. Uh, so we, we did talk about uh, all of these, and plus we talked about the international situation, the need for countries uh, that uh, are being pressured by the United States uh, to come together to uh, insist on respect for the rule of law, Charter of the United Nations, and to cooperate with each other in defeating these illegal sanctions. Before we go further on those topics, I would like to ask you, after the sabotage attack denounced by President Maduro at the Venezuelan main oil refinery, I wonder if Iran isn't afraid of the risk that the collaboration and oil industry could carry to your country. I mean, will this bilateral collaboration go even further? It will, of course, go further. Um, we have survived uh, over 40 years of this type of pressure by the United States. And if we wanted to give up, we would have given up a long time ago. <laughs> OK. On the United States, Elliot Abrams, the U.S. State Department Special Representative for Iran and Venezuela, has said, and quote, the transfer of long-range missiles from the Iran to Venezuela is not acceptable to the United States and will not be tolerated or permitted. A. Is it true that the Venezuelan government has been buying weapons to Iran? And B. What do you think about the threat made by the U.S. administration to Iran and Venezuela? Well, uh, it is totally legitimate for Iran and Venezuela to have defense cooperation. Uh, the United States tried to prevent uh, that in the Security Council, and it failed. Uh, it failed uh, drastically by 13 to 2, uh, and that is why uh, the United States is resorting to its old 
uh, strategy of uh, basically uh, threatening uh, and bullying uh, countries. Uh, Iran and Venezuela uh, have not allowed themselves to be bullied by the United States, and I think this will continue to be the case. Our cooperation is quite legitimate. Uh, we will continue to cooperate with Venezuela uh, in areas that... Even in the military area? Uh, 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 even in the defense area, and we believe that it is the right of Venezuela to purchase uh, military equipment from any place they want. But what Venezuela needs and what Iran has to offer are things that we will be discussed between our defense officials uh, and will continue uh, to be a subject of our bilateral relations. So I Iran think that's none of the United States business. So Iran is not afraid of virtual new sanctions from the White House? Well, basically, as uh, Michael O'Brien, uh, the national security advisor to President Trump, has said, uh, there are no sanctions left for the United States to impose on Iran. So they have basically out-sanctioned themselves. <laughs> you have recently said, and I quote, it's not what new U.S. administration says during campaign that counts, but what it does in office. What would be the U.S. foreign policy after this election? Is there a difference between Democrats and Republicans in office? What do you think of it? Uh, well, uh, we don't know who will be in the White House yet uh, after, this, uh, after this election. Uh, but there are obvious differences between these two camps, particularly uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, there is even a divergence within the Republican Party about the type of uh, diplomacy that President Trump has been pursuing or not pursuing, basically, because we haven't seen much diplomacy during President Trump. We've seen a lot of threats uh, by him and by his Secretary of State. So there will be differences. Uh, but what is important for us is not the tone or the uh, rhetoric, but the actions. Uh, the United States is, has uh, engaged in illegal activity against Iran, has uh, hurt our economy, has hurt our people, uh, and it has to change its, its practice if it wants the situation to change. Do you have any hope that the United States will return to the nuclear deal with Iran? Well, uh, the nuclear deal is not a revolving door. Uh, the United States uh, decide, uh, decided to leave that deal. Uh, now, if it wants to come back, it has to gain a seat at the negotiating table. Uh, but what is important uh, is that the United States did not have the right uh, to leave the, uh, the deal because it is not just a bilateral deal between Iran and the United States, it's a part of a Security Council resolution. So if the United States wanted to be uh, basically free from the obligations in, in, the, uh, in that resolution, it should have withdrawn from the United Nations not just from a deal. Iran has recently uh, won a victory at the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, how do you receive that? Uh, well, we, we defeated the United States three times in the Security Council uh, in the last few months. Uh, and that shows how isolated U.S. policy of maximum pressure and U.S. bullying uh, has become in the international community. Uh, it's not a victory for Iran, but it's, it's a victory for international law, uh, for the United Nations Charter, and for United Nations Security Council resolutions. In early January, when General Qasem Soleimani was murdered by the U.S. forces in Iraq, responding, by the way, to President Donald Trump's orders, Iran promised to revenge. I wonder what kind of revenge has the Iranian government already accomplished its promise or not yet? Well, uh, we took proportionate military action against uh, a terrorist operation by the United States uh, targeting the base from which uh, the military uh, attack against, uh, the terrorist attack against General Soleimani was conducted. But the fact of the matter is the United States committed a grave uh, crime and uh, the, the consequences of that grave crime, particularly the public consequences 
and the impact on the feeding of the people of Iran and Iraq, as you saw in the processions, the funeral processions of General Soleimani uh, in both countries as well as elsewhere in the Middle East, will continue to haunt the United States. Uh, one of the consequences has been uh, that the Iraqi parliament asked the United States to leave Iraq, and I believe that's the ultimate price that the United States will have to pay uh, for its adventurism and its aggression and terrorism in Iraq against General Soleimani. Will the U.S. troops quit the Middle East someday? What do you think of Trump's announcements on that? Will he deliver on what he promised before leaving the White House, if he leaves the, house, the White House, or are his promises nothing more than mere propaganda? Well, uh, mostly it's propaganda. Uh, and he's been very clear that uh, in places that they are present, they're present not to protect people, not even to protect American interests, but to protect oil. Uh, that's what he has said about Syria, uh, that they are there uh, simply to guard the oil fields uh, and to take advantage, that is to steal uh, the wealth of the Syrian people. That's the right verb, to steal uh, yeah, the that's, Syrian that's oil. That's the right wo word, because they, they are not uh, authorized to be there. They've they never been asked to, to send forces to Syria. So they're there illegally, they're occupying parts of Syria, and they're stealing their, their wealth. Okay, I remember that President Hassan Rouhani at the UN General Assembly in September 2019 uh, invited all the countries directly affected by the developments uh, by the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz to the Coalition of Hope meaning Hormuz peace and the war. Is that peace coalition currently possible, taking into consideration the recent restoration of bilateral ties between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and the state of Israel, taking into consideration also the historical ties between Saudi Arabia and the United States of America, taking into consideration the recent discovery of an Israeli secret embassy in Manama, and last but not least, taking into consideration the remaining, uh, remaining I say, American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, uh, the, the policies that you just mentioned are all wrong policies and harmful policies uh, that harm the region, harm the Palestinian cause, and harm, uh, first and foremost, the population of the countries uh, that you just mentioned. Uh, but the fact of the matter is you don't choose your neighbors. Uh, the, uh, these countries, uh, countries in the southern Persian Gulf, are our neighbors, and we have a policy of maintaining friendly relations with our neighbors. So uh, the offer is on the table. If they ch choose to use that offer, uh, they're welcome to do so. There are requirements on all sides, uh, and we are prepared to do our part, and we expect them to do theirs. On the very recent attacks in France and other European countries, President Macron has said that they have been a consequence of the so-called Islamist terrorism. What do you think of his accusations? And what do you think of the way Europe deals with these violent attacks? Uh, well, uh, Islam has nothing to do with terrorism, and uh, the, the concept Islamic terrorism is a forgery. Uh, and it's not becoming for, for the president of a civilized country to, to use a forged uh, name. Uh, but uh, we condemn terrorism, we condemn ex extremism. But don't forget, that these extremists uh, that are conducting these terrorist operations uh, are uh, sponsored by U.S. and Western allies in the region, most prominently Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the ideology that they espouse uh, is basically promoted uh, by Saudi Arabia, has been for, for a long time. So it's hypocritical uh, to condemn uh, Muslims for something that uh, Western allies are, are doing. Uh, I believe desecration of values is an act of violence. Uh, it doesn't uh, justify 
a violent response. But we should not forget that the act of violence through desecration, through insult, uh, is directed against the entire 1.9 billion uh, population in the Muslim world. Is the French state adopting a correct position on what France thinks? Is the freedom of speech and expression? Well, um, obviously, uh, it's hypocritical to call attacks on others' freedom of speech while you do not even uh, allow certain issues to be discussed in, in, in public. Uh, freedom of expression when you do not allow Muslims to wear uh, Islamic hijab in schools in, in France, that's an expression. Why don't you allow that and you allow somebody to harm the feelings of, of millions and billions of Muslims both in France and elsewhere in the world? Correct. What is the Iranian point of view on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? How could the conflict affect the stability of Iran? Well, it is happening at our border, basically. Uh, that's the site of the violence. Uh, we have been very clear that occupation of territory is not permitted. Change of international boundaries is unacceptable. Uh, and uh, territories of Azerbaijan that have been occupied must be uh, evacuated and liberated. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are concerned first about human casualties, uh, about civilian casualties, uh, also about the fact that extremist uh, organizations have been brought to the site of conflict to act as mercenaries. Uh, on, the, on the battleground, and that's a threat not only to Iran, but to the entire region of peace and security. So we believe that that has to end, uh, but occupation also has to end. Would the Iranian government be willing to mediate in this conflict? Well, uh, uh, I asked my deputy to go to both Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia, as well as to Russia and Turkey, and offer our proposal for mediation. Now, uh, our proposal, which is a rather detailed uh, proposal about uh, what needs to be done, uh, is on the table. It's being considered uh, by, the, by the two parties plus the neighbors uh, in, in Turkey and Russia, and we will wait for their response. Okay. So, uh, how does the Iranian government bet on multipolarity? How does Iran conceive the new geopolitics according to the current facts worldwide? Well, we believe that the new international order has not been formed yet, but it certainly will not be a unipolar world, and it certainly will not be a Western world. Uh, it's a post-Western world. Uh, I don't know about the polarity in this post-Western world. Uh, it may be multipolar and, or it may be non-polar. Uh, we will see, because now the players in the international community are much uh, wider than the community of states. Uh, individuals, groups, uh, non-state actors, corporations uh, have become actors in the global scene. So we will have to wait and see how this uh, new global order develops. Speaking on the community of states, uh, what is your opinion on the current leadership of multilateral organizations, so what is missing from that leadership, the United Nations, the Security Council, for instance? Well, I believe it is important for international organizations to be truly uh, multilateral uh, and not uh, impacted and affected by the policies of a unilateralist government. Unfortunately, the United States has an undue uh, influence in many international organizations, while the policy of the, United, uh, of the United States is only to take advantage of these international organizations uh, to the extent uh, uh, of its interest. Uh, we just saw in the Security Council how the United States tried to abuse the Security Council uh, in a rather absurd fashion in order to advance its illegitimate interest against Iran uh, and how it was rebuffed by 13 members of the Security Council. So these are the realities, and I think uh, particularly the Secretariat 
uh, of these international organizations must be vigilant uh, to avoid uh, being abused and misused by, by the United States. During this visit to the region, you also have Cuba on the agenda. How have the bilateral ties between uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Caribbean island? Is there any new agreement to sign in Havana? Uh, well, we have excellent relations with Cuba. We've had excellent relations with Cuba since the revolution. Uh, we both suffer from the wrongful policies and, and practices of the United States and we have naturally developed very close uh, cooperation in, in various fields uh, from uh, science and technology and biotechnology uh, to energy and other areas of cooperation. Uh, I will go and discuss with them both uh, political issues as well as further economic cooperation uh, between, between Iran and Cuba. And then after Cuba, I'm glad that I'm going to participate in the inauguration of the democratically elected uh, president of Bolivia. So, by the way, uh, how have been the, the ties between the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran and Bolivia? I mean, the new Bolivia uh, with the recently elected president uh, Luis Arce and before with President Evo Morales. Well, we had, we had uh, extremely good relations with President Evo Morales and we look forward to having uh, very good relations with, with the new democratically elected government of Bolivia. Unfortunately, we did not have very positive relations uh, with the government that took away uh, the, the votes of the people. Your Excellency, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Well, this has been a special interview with the Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Mr. Mohammed Yavid Zarif. Thank you very much. Thank you.